file 26. As I emerged from my unconsciousness, which could not, I think, have lasted more than a few minutes, I was aware of a most dreadful and penetrating smell. Putting out my hand in the darkness, I came upon something which felt like a huge lump of meat, while my other hand closed upon a large bone. Up above me there was a circle of starlit sky, which showed me that I was lying at the bottom of a deep pit. Slowly I staggered to my feet and felt myself all over. I was stiff and sore from head to foot, but there was no limb which would not move, no joint which would not bend. As the circumstances of my fall came back into my confused brain, I looked up in terror, expecting to see that dreadful head silhouetted against the paling sky. There was no sign of the monster, however, nor could I hear any sound from above. I began to walk slowly round, therefore, feeling in every direction to find out what this strange place could be into which I had been so opportunely precipitated. It was, as I have said, a pit, with sharply sloping walls and a level bottom about twenty feet across. This bottom was littered with great gobbets of flesh, most of which was in the last stage of putridity. The atmosphere was poisonous and horrible. After tripping and stumbling over these lumps of decay, I came suddenly against something hard, and I found that an upright post was firmly fixed to the centre of the hollow. It was so high that I could not reach the top of it with my hand, and it appeared to be covered with grease. Suddenly I remembered that I had a tin box of wax vestas in my pocket. Striking one of them, I was able at last to form some opinion of the place into which I had fallen. There could be no question as to its nature. It was a trap, made by the hand of man. The post in the centre, some nine feet long, was sharpened at the upper end, and was black with the stale blood of the creatures who had been impaled upon it. The remains scattered about were fragments of the victims, which had been cut away in order to clear the stake for the next who might blunder in. I remembered that Challenger had declared that man could not exist upon the plateau, since with his feeble weapons he could not hold his own against the monsters who roamed over it. But now it was clear enough how it could be done. In their narrow-mouthed caves, the natives, whoever they might be, had refuges into which the huge Saurians could not penetrate while with their developed brains they were capable of setting such traps, covered with branches, across the paths which marked the run of the animals, as would destroy them in spite of all their strength and activity. Man was always the master. The sloping wall of the pit was not difficult for an active man to climb, but I hesitated long before I trusted myself within reach of the dreadful creature which had so nearly destroyed me. How did I know that he was not lurking in the nearest clump of bushes, waiting for my reappearance? I took heart, however, as I recalled a conversation between Challenger and Summerlee upon the habits of the great Saurians. Both were agreed that the monsters were practically brainless, that there was no room for reason in their tiny cranial cavities, and that if they have disappeared from the rest of the world, it was assuredly on account of their own stupidity, which made it impossible for them to adapt themselves to changing conditions. To lie in wait for me now would mean that the creature had appreciated what had happened to me, and this in turn would argue some power connecting cause and effect. 
Surely it was more likely that a brainless creature acting solely by vague predatory instinct would give up the chase when I disappeared, and after a pause of astonishment would wander away in search of some other prey. I clambered to the edge of the pit and looked over. The stars were fading, the sky was whitening, and the cold wind of morning blew pleasantly on my face. I could see or hear nothing of my enemy. Slowly I climbed out and sat for a while upon the ground, ready to spring back into my refuge if any danger should appear. Then, reassured by the absolute stillness and by the growing light, I took my courage in both hands and stole back along the path which I had come. Some distance down it, I picked up my gun, and shortly afterwards struck the brook which was my guide. So, with many a frightened backward glance, I made for home. And suddenly there came something to remind me of my absent companions. In the clear, still morning air, there sounded far away the sharp, hard note of a rifle shot. I paused and listened. But there was nothing more. For a moment I was shocked at the thought that some sudden danger might have befallen them, but then a simpler and more natural explanation came to my mind. It was now broad daylight. They had imagined that I was lost in the woods, and had fired this shot to guide me home. It is true that we had made a strict resolution against firing, but if it seemed to them that I might be in danger, they would not hesitate. It was for me now to hurry on as fast as possible, and so to reassure them. I was weary and spent, so my progress was not as fast as I wished, but at last I came into regions which I knew. There was the swamp of the pterodactyls upon my left, there in front of me was the glade of the iguanodons. Now I was in the last belt of trees which separated me from Fort Challenger. I raised my voice in a cheery shout to allay their fears. My heart sank at that ominous stillness. I quickened my pace into a run. The zareba rose before me even as I had left it, but the gate was open. I rushed in. In the cold morning light it was a fearful sight which met my eyes. Our effects were scattered in wild confusion over the ground. My comrades had disappeared, and close to the smouldering ashes of the fire the grass was stained crimson with a hideous pool of blood. I was so stunned by this sudden shock that for a time I must have nearly lost my reason. I have a vague recollection, as one remembers a bad dream, of rushing about through the woods all round the empty camp, calling wildly for my companions. No answer came back from the silent shadows. The horrible thought that I might never see them again, that I might find myself abandoned all alone in that dreadful place, with no possible way of descending into the world below, that I might live and die in that nightmare country, drove me to desperation. I could have torn my hair and beaten my head in my despair. Only now did I realize how I had learned to lean upon my companions, upon the serene self-confidence of Challenger, and upon the masterful, humorous, coolness of Lord Roxton. Without them I was like a child in the dark, helpless and powerless. I did not know which way to turn or what I should do first. After a period during which I sat in bewilderment, I set myself to try and discover what sudden misfortune could have befallen my companions. The whole disordered appearance of the camp showed that there had been some sort of attack, and the rifle shot no doubt marked the time when it had occurred. 
that there should have been only one shot showed that it had been all over in an instant. The rifles still lay upon the ground, and one of them, Lord John's, had the empty cartridge in the breech. The blankets of Challenger and of Summerlee beside the fire suggested that they had been asleep at the time. The cases of ammunition and of food were scattered about in a wild litter, together with our unfortunate cameras and plate carriers, but none of them were missing. On the other hand, all the exposed provisions, and I remembered that there were a considerable quantity of them, were gone. They were animals then, and not natives who had made the inroad, for surely the latter would have left nothing behind. But if animals, or some single terrible animal, then what had become of my comrades? A ferocious beast would surely have destroyed them and left their remains. It is true that there was that one hideous pool of blood which told of violence. Such a monster as had pursued me during the night could have carried away a victim as easily as a cat could a mouse. In that case, the others would have followed in pursuit, but then they would assuredly have taken their rifles with them. The more I tried to think it out with my confused and weary brain, the less I could find any plausible explanation. I searched round in the forest, but could see no tracks which could help me to a conclusion. Once I lost myself, and it was only by good luck and after an hour of wandering that I found the camp once more. Suddenly a thought came to me and brought some little comfort to my heart. I was not absolutely alone in the world. Down at the bottom of the cliff, and within call of me, was waiting the faithful Zambo. I went to the edge of the plateau and looked over. Sure enough, he was squatting amongst the blankets beside his fire in his little camp. But to my amazement, a second man was seated in front of him. For an instant my heart leapt for joy as I thought that one of my comrades had made his way safely down. But a second glance dispelled the hope. The rising sun shone red upon the man's skin. He was an Indian. I shouted loudly and waved my handkerchief. Presently Zambo looked up, waved his hand, and turned to ascend the pinnacle. In a short time he was standing close to me, and listening with deep distress to the story which I told him. "'Devil got them, sure, Mr. Malone,' said he. "'You got into the devil's country, sir, and he take you all to himself.' You take advice, Massa Malone, and come down quick, else he get you as well. Well, how can I come down, Zambo? You get creepers from trees, Massa Malone. Throw them over here. I make fast to this stump, and so you have bridge. We thought of that. There are no creepers here which could bear us. Send for ropes, Massa Malone. Who can I send, and where? Send to Indian village, sir. Plenty hide ropes in Indian village. Indian down below, send him. Who is he? One of our Indians. Other ones beat him and take away his pay. He come back to us. Ready now to take letter. Bring rope. Anything. To take a letter? Why not? Perhaps he might bring help. But in any case, he would ensure that our lives were not spent for nothing, and that news of all that we had won for science should reach our friends at home. I had two completed letters already waiting. I would spend the day in writing a third, which would bring my experiences absolutely up to date. The Indian could bear this back to the world, 
I ordered Zambo, therefore, to come again in the evening, and I spent my miserable and lonely day in recording my own adventures of the night before. I also drew up a note to be given to any white merchant or captain of a steamboat whom the Indian could find, imploring them to see that ropes were sent to us, since our lives must depend upon it. These documents I threw to Zambo in the evening, and also my purse, which contained three English sovereigns. These were to be given to the Indian, and he was promised twice as much if he returned with the ropes. So now you will understand, my dear Mr. McArdle, how this communication reaches you, and you will also know the truth in case you never hear again from your unfortunate correspondent. Tonight I am too weary and too depressed to make my plans. Tomorrow I must think out some way by which I shall keep in touch with this camp, and yet search round for any traces 